Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. Today on the show, we've got LeBron smelling an opportunity, a modest proposal to the Warriors, and the week's hottest releases. And of course, we have Hard Pass. But before we get started, I just wanted to say it's been a joy putting together this episode after the nonsense of the past few weeks. It's a great feeling not to feel some sort of obligation to talk about that anymore. Like, let the people who are actually personally connected to that deal with it. And for those still defending all of that, Here's a tweet by my close personal friend, John Legend, for you. All right, let's start with some hot takes. Victor Wambanyama, holy shit. Man, he would look so good in purple and gold. He'll be the most exciting rookie we've had since the GOAT that got away, Alex Caruso. Okay, I have to know in the comments, if the number one spot was guaranteed and the New Orleans pick swap didn't exist, should the Lakers tank for the kid or maybe even trade LeBron for him? I I would say AD, but I already know the answer to that. So Laker fans are pretty fickle, Anthony Davis. I'm sorry, championships or not. DJ Khaled announced the release date of his We The Best Air Jordan 5s in the most Khaled way possible, declaring Cyber Monday the biggest day of the year. Somebody needs to tell him about Black Friday that's actually three days earlier and the entire month of February when we get our tax refund checks? Come on, bro. But regardless, congratulations to him. All those meetings finally paid off. Wait, is he... Is he still in the meeting? And the bigger question is, who else is in the meeting? Anyway, Bronny James has signed an NIL deal with Nike. Shocking news, I know. LeBron and Savannah must have really been sweating it when Bronny got offers from Adidas and Puma. Bronny jumping ship would be like that time cousin Greg did that thing and then that thing happened. Sorry, succession spoilers. But man, could you imagine the sneaker drama if Bronny showed up to Sierra Canyon wearing Ultra Boost or played a game in Puma MB01s? Can we get that in the story mode, 2K? That would be awesome. Uh, Nigel Sylvester has a new Air Jordan 1s on the way. I can already see that Tiny Swoosh getting purists in their feelings. Regardless, it's cool to see how far the ones have come from being just a basketball shoe, from BMX to golf to skateboarding to football to even esports. The ones are basically everywhere. And it's still growing, man. Like, sure, Kevin Durant is the first ballot Hall of Famer and one of the greatest hoopers ever, but his enduring legacy might be the first guy to wear Travis Scott ones on a pickleball court. Blaze that trail, KD. No one can hurt you there with mean pickleball tweets. I wouldn't, even if he was pickleballing right. Okay. So we're gonna do like a big old NBA sneaker season preview, but I think we'll save that one for next week. This week, there's more pressing issues right now that I think need to be resolved. I'm talking about the Golden State Warriors. Look, they need to blow that shit up. I mean, the writing's on the wall. After Draymond Green's unfortunate outburst, and let's just call it a falcon punch against teammate Jordan Poole, I don't know if they can survive such a team breaking moment. Like. Will Poole and the Warriors' young core of players like James Wiseman and Jonathan Kuminga really want to stay with that team that tolerates such abhorrent behavior? Can Draymond even begin to pick up the pieces and rebuild the trust with Steph, Clay, and Coach Steve Kerr, a core that has won them four championships in eight seasons? I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. It might be too much. The pressure to produce another championship, even though they already won one post-Kevin Durant, is a lot to handle. Maybe it's time for them to shake things up and start over. I mean, who wouldn't want to see Steph Curry play for another team? Perhaps a homecoming to Charlotte where he gets to play with LaMelo Ball. Like, I would love to see the discourse where Draymond puts up triple singles for another team when he's no longer at his peak abilities. Hell, Clay. He doesn't even have to play in the NBA. He can just roam the world and become China clay, Japan clay, Spanish clay, Philippines clay. The possibilities are endless. I'm just saying, Warriors, think about it. Maybe not winning another championship is best for business. Do the right thing. Trade everybody. Go after Victor Wambanyama. It's right there for you. Signed a very concerned 17-time world champion Los Angeles Lakers fan who will gladly trade Pat Bev and literally everybody not named LeBron and AD for Steph and or Clay. Honestly, we're ready. All right. It's the Heat Check, where we bring you everything that's dropping this week. We have the Nike Dunk Low Florida A&M on the 18th for 120. The Nike LeBron 20 Eternal Flame. This is for Nike App member access. That's on the 18th for $200. Ambush Nike Air Adjust Force University Blue and Light Matter Root. Those are on the 18th for 210. The Air Jordan 9 Boot NRG Military Brown and Black Light Gum on the 19th for 225 each. The Nike Air More Up Tempo 96. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. And honestly, thank you, Mr. Wilson on the 21st for 175. The Nike KD 15 Aunt Pearl on the the 21st for 150 the Mason Margiela Reebok Insta Pump Fury Citron and Echo Blue on the 21st for $400 each the Air Jordan 7 which had a tan on the 22nd for 210 and then the uh, Salehi Bimberry Crocs Paulus Claw Kuwata on October 22nd 
for $85. Then for the pick of the week is the 218 Air Jordan 2 Low. This is a global release on the 21st for 200. So if you don't know, 218 is a relatively new sneaker boutique having just opened its doors this past February. But the backing of their sister store, Burn Rubber, puts them slightly ahead of the pack as evidenced by this earthly toned Air Jordan 2 collab. A sneaker that looks perfect on the feet of a typical hype beast or your uncle who's on his way to church. It's an impressive first outing by the 218 crew and I can't wait to see what they have in store next. All right. Now for a heat check on the Nike LeBron 20. So here's what we said about the Nike LeBron 19 last year. I think the thought on sneaker Twitter that crystallized the feeling behind the Nike LeBron 19 was this one from my guy Russ Bingston. In his tweet, he says that the whole LeBron line really needs a reboot or, and no disrespect to Jason Petrie who really revitalized the line when he started working on it, a new design lead. Okay. It was Russ who said it, but we agree with the sentiment. LeBron's signature shoe line hasn't been making a lot of bangers lately. We're a little more forgiving than your typical sneakerhead who hates LeBron just because he exists, but even we have had a tough time getting pumped for a new LeBron signature shoe. The 19s didn't do it, the 18s are meh, the 17s, 16s, and 15s had a few bright spots, and the less we talk about the 14s, the 13s, and the 12s, well, the better. Look. Really, it's been a full generation since LeBron captured our attention with the Nike LeBron 10 with five color waves like the Crown Jewel or the Cutting Jade or the What the MVP or the sportswear offshoots like the Cork and the Championship Pack. Man, those were simpler times back then. But like Russ said, something had to change. And with that Nike LeBron 20, they changed, all right? Some might say they changed to something familiar and I would co-sign that, but unlike others, I don't see the problem with it. Here's Anthony Davis, noted Kobe guy, talking about wearing the LeBron 20. Got LeBron's got you in his shoes. I'm wondering. Oh, no, I changed. I didn't change. I've been waiting on you know, the heat to come. You know, you know I see a lot going on with Nike and all that stuff. I don't even want to get into it, but LeBron's an opportunist. He saw, the, he saw the opportunity. He saw, so the door. He saw, he saw a door over. He saw it. I was a free agent. He was like, you know, they were just sitting in my locker. I'm like, let's see. He's like, try these, man. Hmm. Is LeBron James an ultimate opportunist? Well, he did skip filming on the shop that day when what's his face was gonna be there, but yeah, he totally is. On that day, AD can see clearly. Anyways, both Co-Rider and myself have pairs of the Nike LeBron 20 time machine. It's really a LeBron signature shoe unlike any other. Typically, the debut LeBron is about designing a coat of armor to protect the king who just so happens to be a six foot nine inch, 250 pound freak of nature. You're not building a sleek sports car for him. You're building a freaking tank. But the LeBron 20, it ain't like that. In fact, a big part of the 20s marketing is that it's designed for the next generation, namely LeBron's sons, Bronny and Bryce. I can't help but wonder if LeBron and Jason Petrie asked the kids for some inspiration, and when they came back, it was just one note. Make them like Kobe's. And everybody was like, huh, yeah, okay. Well, with production over what's next for Nike and the Bryan estate still up in the air, Davis himself said he was still waiting for the heat to come. This was a great time for LeBron to try something different. From a purely aesthetic standpoint, it's the most accessible LeBron in a long time. With the time machine being a brisk seller, I guess we'll see if the momentum continues with the wider release of the Eternal Flame colorway and the rest. They're even nailing it with the commercials, with LeBron and his kids bringing back memories of not only the iconic Kobe jumping over an Aston Martin spot, but the classic LeBron spots with James taking on different family members. Hey, how come NJ never did this kind of stuff with... Never mind. Huh. All right, it's time for this week's Hard Pass, where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go. Like sneaker culture's annoyance towards Nike after they recently announced there were gonna be new countermeasures in their fight against bots. According to the Wall Street Journal via CNBC, because their article is behind a paywall and we're not paying for a wall, get it? Anyway, uh, previous versions of Nike's terms already prohibited buying products for resale. But the new rules allow the company to cancel orders placed with bots. Nike also added that it can decline refunds, charge restocking fees, and suspend the accounts of users it suspects of reselling. The company also said it can reject orders if an account has an excessive amount of returns or exceeds product purchase limits. So no more TikToks of resellers returning dozens of pairs of stealth grade 12s after they realized that they were bricks. Man, calling any pair of 12s a bricks is insulting the greatness and legacy of the 12, but you know what? That's not what we're here to talk about. On the other hand, I can understand why sneakerheads and regular consumers might look at this news and just wave it off like Draymond waves off chill vibes and contract extensions. When I first heard this news, I was like, why is this news? 
Hasn't Nike been doing this for years now? And then I read on the non-Wall Street Journal stories, and it looks like Nike is taking the next step and really tracking down the habits of resellers after they buy the shoes. Again, these are things that Nike should have nipped in the bud years ago, but I guess better late than never. There's been this delicate balancing act by Nike where they tolerate some frustrations among the sneaker community as long as they are buying enough products to meet or exceed their bottom line. But as Nike started to see certain Jordan retros sitting on shelves, pandas selling out faster than they can restock them, overstocks on other inventory as the real world continues to adapt to the new normal and growing disillusionment on social media, they had to do something, anything to curry favor again. And this news is, well, it's probably not going to ease the frustration of a lot of people right away as evidenced by the reaction online. They're gonna to have to do the work. So how would it work? Besides keeping an eye on purchase histories, it seems like the company is going to use all of the handy metadata we've been willingly giving them throughout the years on the sneakers app and the regular Nikes app. You know that story a year ago about the sneakers app handing out exclusive access to select people depending on how they use the app? By the way, are, are we still getting exclusive access out here? I haven't, but Co-Rider got one last year for the Air Jordan 3 patchwork camo. However, he is also zero for a thousand this year. According to Nike, you were granted exclusive access based on your usage of the app, including how often you watch their live streams or future product or checked out their various editorial features. They never explicitly say what you needed to tap in order to get exclusive access. But I'm guessing if you were an active user of the app beyond just checking out product pages at 6.55 a.m. on a Saturday morning, your chances were better. So. Who's to say that Nike couldn't flush out bot accounts that only visit one product page or figure out why hundreds of pairs are going to the same four or five PO boxes with different virtual card numbers? Nike also uses geolocation when they do their sneakers pass. It's not outside of the realm of possibility that Nike could simply just track a reseller and ban them that way. We've been giving Nike valuable data for years now. You know when you buy stuff from a Nike store or outlet and they ask for a pass that has a QR code? Co-Rider checked out his app and he's been a Nike member of some shape or form since 2002. They know Co-Rider, probably a little too much if we're being honest. Shouldn't have tied your fuel band to your account there, buddy. Anyway, y'all remember fuel bands? Anyway, he also remembered during his blogging days when he had to share his Nike account data for some event. So now he suspects the reason he never gets exclusive access to the big releases is because it's payback for all those jokes he made about Jordan fanboys. I'm not gonna say he's wrong, but I'm also not inclined to say he's right at the moment. What I do know is that Nike won't give a shit if Co-Rider buys a pair of hype sneakers and returns it a day later or sells it down the line five years later, dead stock or not. They got bigger fish to chase. Like, do I believe that Nike as a company likes resellers? No. I think they know it's bad for business when the perception is that sneakers zap of it all is rigged in favor of those who are willing to game the system. I also think that up to a certain point, a sale is a sale. It doesn't matter if 100 people buy 100 pairs of off-whites or if one person with 100 bots buys 100 pairs of off-whites. Once it leaves their warehouse, it's out of their hands. They're not happy when resellers buy up their inventory, but they're also not hurting because, again, a sale is a sale. Maybe the tipping point for them was seeing thousands of the same sneakers being returned by the same few people because they weren't worth flipping. So how will I know that this new approach is actually working? Well, probably TikTok. Resellers of a certain generation love to share their wins, but they also love to share their L's even when they probably shouldn't. So if Nike is really serious about this, you'll see TikToks of resellers with zero self-awareness and common sense out themselves, complaining that Nike is prohibiting them from buying sneakers in bolt or returning bricks. But at the same time, you will also see an uptick in TikToks of kids being excited that they were finally able to catch a win on the sneakers app. We don't have to wait for Nike to announce the results of their new efforts in their quarterly earnings report. We'll know it sooner than later, thanks to the Zoomers' desire to just overshare. But will this spell doom for resellers? No. Look, to quote my close personal friend and colleague, Jeff Goldblum, star of the hit Disney Plus series, The World According to Jeff Bloom, featuring your boy in the debut episode, life finds a way. Smart resellers will find a way to get over this speed bump. There are still sons and daughters of Nike executives and Charlotte Hornets owners with access and connections that will get them the sneakers they want to flip. Established resellers who have history dating back to the 99 and the 2000 will still get the kicks they need to sell to PJ Tucker or other celebrities. Platforms like StockX will continue to exist. I mean, they got NFTs, baby. Oh, and side note, so the most recent sale of a StockX NFT for the Jordan 1 patent leather bread were for $218, which you can redeem for a real Jordan 1 patent leather bread in a size 10. The going rate for a Jordan 1 patent leather bread in a size 10 right now, $240. Huh, that math's not math in there. 
So look, Nike might not be able to take out the Benjamin kicks of the world, but what they could be doing with their recent moves is taking out the low to mid-level resellers. I'm talking about the ones who have zero celebrity clientele, but show off their dozens of boxes of trophy room ones while smoking weed on Instagram like it's something to be impressed by. They're the ones who just opened up a shop at the mall and can provide you with anything interesting beyond having a full-size run of Panda Dunks. In a twisted way, Nike could be killing the mom and pop resellers the same way they killed the mom and pop shops. But this time, I don't think the sneakerhead community is going to mind, especially if they start racking up wins on the sneakers app. So let's just wait and see how it all plays out. All right, that's going to do it for the show. Thank you for watching Hard Pass. I am Jacques Slade. I'll see you next week. If you would like to be possibly featured in a future episode, call us at 818-493-9325. Leave a short message, your socials if you want, no more than 30 seconds. All right, I'll see you guys next week. Peace.